Hello and uh, welcome everyone to the first episode of the of this short series um, staging ancient Greek tragedy then and now hosted here at UCL in occasion of UCL's annual classical play which this year will be Euripides Electra running from the 9th to the, to the 11th of February 2022 at the Bloomsbury Theatre in London. For information on tickets, pre-show talks, as well as videos, essays about the play can be found on our website, uclrqk slash classic slash classical hyphen play. I am joined today by the director and assistant director of this year's play, Zoe Morris and Lucy Rudman, uh, who will be interviewing our two special guests, on this week's um, episode on dramaturgy and Greek tragedy then and now. Professor Oliver Taplin, Professor Emeritus of Classics at the University of Oxford, and Dr Estelle Boudou, Marie Curie Research Fellow and Dramaturg. So over to you Zoe and Lucy. Hello. Hi. So we've got our first question here um, and I thought I, I, I'll read it out. Um, in our rehearsal process, an aspect of Greek drama which has a complex space in a complex place in a modern staging is the chorus, and we've chosen to highlight our chorus as a community, but also to carve out individual characters within that community. What are some key questions we should keep in mind when approaching the Greek chorus? So. I think it's really interesting what you say about wanting to make the chorus a community, because in my experience, that's specifically the problem, representing a community. You know, it's always we think, oh, that's a solution. It's not a solution, it's a problem. The problem is how do you represent a community on stage right now? And we have this problem because we don't know anything about how ancient Athens was thinking about a community, what was the sense of communality back then. But it's also a problem because we are in a very individualistic world, right? So representing a community for us is a complicated thing. And uh, in my own experience, the solution to that will be to acknowledge this difficulty and to work much more on the building of the community than about Oh, we have a community it's it's like it's not a presupposition it must be an horizon in the performance so that will be the first thing i would recommend to have in mind is that um representing a community is a problem and not a solution that will be my first point do you want to say something about that oliver um yes i i was thinking a, a related but different thought which is one of the great uh, potential advantages of a chorus is is that you you then have two different ways of seeing what happens. I mean, the, the audience are presented with two different. There's the the way that the agents of the 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 solo characters experience their world, and there's the way that this group uh, experience it, and uh, they experience it quite differently because they're they're trying to understand it rather than to act rather than to enact it, if you see what I mean. Um, and so these two different ways of, uh, of seeing what happens relates interestingly to what you say about individualizing the chorus. Because the more you individualize them, the more you fragment the, uh, the group perception, the, the communal perception. So there, there is, a, there is a, a tension there, I think. Yeah, and then you have to answer another question. It's what brings these people together? What, what's the situation that brings these people together? And why are they staying together in the course of the play? It's not enough to say why they are together at the beginning. The question is also why are they staying together? And, um, and then you have to think about what are they doing together? There is a question of co-activity, but there is always the other side of the coin, which is, the co-passivity of the chorus, because the chorus is also not doing anything together. So that's the two, it's, we always think about, oh, what are they doing? And we have ideas about activities of the chorus, but what is the non-activity of the chorus? What is the passivity of the chorus? This, um, I think, Oliver, your point about um, the individuals and fragmenting the, the whole made me think about 
the extent to which we should see the chorus as people almost, and whether the choral body is a body of people or if they should be seen as a body of something else. Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. I hadn't thought of that before. No, that's an interesting way of putting it. And because um, partly they, it seems to me that they hold together the time and place. Um, uh, I'm not talking about the, the so-called unities, but I'm talking about the fact that, you know, the, the, the chorus keep, they, they anchor, they anchor the locality um, of, of the play. Um, and they keep its continuity. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's not to do with being individual people. It's to do with something to do with the uh, the the groupness, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, which is you know the the, the the very question that Estelle started by by pointing out that it's not such an easy question and it's a it's a problem as much as it's an answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is something we've been sort of experimenting with is the, the chorus sort of as a part of the world is like one of these structures that makes up the world of the play as much as we've been talking about them as a community, maybe made up of individuals, maybe made up of something else. And that's something we sort of tried to bring out in, in the staging. I just wonder how that, because you often, you know, read or hear about the chorus as being a sort of bridge between the world of the play and the world of of the audience and i wonder you know how do we how do we grapple with that yeah estella i mean that's an interesting one yeah it's a very interesting question i think um the first answer will be how you deal with space because it was it was the ancient you know in the ancient theater the courses in between the stage, the actors, and the auditorium, the spectators. So in, in a way, they are just in the middle. So they are the bridge, like physically. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that, you can find solution in, in a very, in a modern theater, in a modern space to renew this bridging uh, position. Mm -hmm. So that will be the first, the first answer is where you put the chorus. Because some, some, some contemporary directors, they put the chorus at, at the back of the stage. So then you're stuck, right? The chorus can't be the link anymore because they are behind the actors and the actors are, are the link, become, become the link, like the, the characters become the link between the audience and the chorus. I think that's a very contemporary way, way to look at it because um, for, for the ancient audience, the chorus was the familiar character. Right, they, they knew about choruses, they were part of choruses. So to access the heroes, they needed the chorus. But maybe for us, because we are in this individualistic world, we need individual characters to bridge with the chorus. Just so you can also reverse the situation. Is, is that clear? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Uh, that sort of is, I don't know if we want to, to move on to our next question, because what you said reminds me very much of our next sort of written question about today there's often this sort of cultural expectation that the story should have this main character whose journey we follow and we're going to ask to what extent you think this can be applied to Greek tragedy and to Euripides Electra in particular I think we're sort of going there anyway so we might as well bring that bring that into it I see that more as a question about the actors than the chorus though mm -hmm. uh, and I mean I, I just um Personally, I don't go along at all with this idea that uh, uh, the Greek tragedy is essentially uh, centered on one individual. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's derived from a lot of intervening uh, reception of Greek tragedy, particularly in the, uh, in the 18th, 19th century, um, which centered particularly around Oedipus, the figure of Oedipus, who Aristotle had put right in the center so you know the essential tragedy is the is the tragedy of the, the individual struggle with fate and so on. And then you start looking at the tragedies, and of course they're about they're about several people. They're about the interactions of people, not about the, not about the individual. At least that that that's what I would say to just to provoke uh, um, the question. Yeah, I, I agree. I I was thinking um, that yeah, Greek tragedy is originally a very collective story. Of course, because of the presence of the chorus, but also because, as Oliver said, 
the hero is always in his environment, his family, his people, his fellow citizen or uh, friends. And so I think the answer to your question is actually a very dramaturgical answer. You can do whatever you want. It's your play, right? So you can decide, and many directors have done that before, to focus on the hero. It's, it's like productions that, have, that had um, a very famous actor that were relying on a famous actor. They did that. They focused on the hero, but it's also because they had a famous actor, right? But you can also decide you want to make the story about the heroes or the main characters, about the family, about the people who are in charge, or you can decide to make, um, to rely on the chorus to make the story very collective. That's your choice as, as directors. So it's a, a dramaturgical question. And I, I, I also want to say that I don't think contemporary audiences are particularly expecting stories to be about a hero. If, if, you, if you think about it, novels, films, even Netflix series are choral stories, are structured around a chorality, around different characters. So I'm not sure contemporary audiences are specifically expecting Greek tragedy to be about one hero. It really depends on how you introduce the story in your own performance. And because when, when a spectator enters an auditorium, um, they just are not expecting anything. So if you start telling, this is a collective story, they will expect a collective story. If you start saying, this is a story about this hero, they will listen to that. You decide and you, you give the, the, you know, the, the first clue. And I think in your plays, maybe you've already decided that you do want a, a central individual, in, which is, I guess that would have to be a lecturer, but um, you, it's, your play makes an interesting contrast with the Electra of Sophocles here, because the, the Electra of Sophocles, you can argue, you know, she's on the stage almost the entire play, and almost the entire play centers around the kind of emotional uh, ups and downs, helter-skelter of that play. But the Euridice play is, is different, isn't it? It's, it's, it's built up of a whole um, changing series of interactions, uh, but, uh, which as Estelle says, you, you then translate into, into stage terms. But um, have, have you already decided on your answer to this question? I don't think particularly, which is why we were asking. Um, there's, there are sort of, I don't know, Zoe, you probably have something to say about this as well. There are moments where it kind of could go in a lot of different directions. And that's some of the stuff that we're working through is the relate, you know, the relationship between the characters and the chorus and the audience and all of that and sort of from who you know from what perspectives are we experiencing this story and and to what extent do we you know do we want or need to pin it on Electra and and everything that's happening to her these are these are very much I think live questions in in our in our rehearsal room yeah and I, I actually think um the chorus plays an interesting role in this for us because so much of what we've done in the rehearsal rooms is is trying to understand what the chorus's um, reaction to Electra joining their community is and kind of experiencing the narrative from their perspective. Um, but something I, that occurred to me as well is that in, in, in Electra, and I think in quite a few Greek tragedies, the absent characters are such a huge part of the, of the narrative and of um, the direction that the plot goes down. And I wonder if they could also be seen in, in that in that space of main characters, at least for for our Electra Agamemnon haunts the play. Um, and I think that that's something that we've also really considered when we've been talking to the characters to the to the actors mm -hmm. is um, is considering the role of these absent figures in in how they they act and how they react to the world around them. Mm -hmm. Something else that's interesting there is the, uh, I think, along with the, the mistaken idea that there's got to be a central hero, is the mistaken idea that the audience should identify with one particular character. It seems to me that that does an injustice to Greek tragedy, which uh, is actually inviting uh, audiences to um, feel with, and not identify, but feel with, several characters and even several characters simultaneously not not only one at a time now in Euripides play there's nobody to, 
one way of putting it is there's nobody who's nice enough to identify with. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a particularly interesting play against the notion of that you should be identifying with one character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll add that there is also a problem with space, um, which is that in, in, in modern theater, usually you have a, an elevated stage or a raised stage. I don't know in what if it's the case in the Bloomsbury Theater, but that's that's a problem because it, it puts a distance between the characters and, and the audience. So if you want to think about um, a very collective story, uh, including the chorus, including the audience, you need to think about the relationship between the stage and the auditorium. And if you have an elevated stage, it's more complicated than if you have everyone on the same level. So it's also a way to think about it. And once you've decided the, the bits of the play that you want to be collective, the bits that you want to be very individualized around the hero, you need to think about the space and where you put them. Are they isolated? Are they you know, on, a, on an elevated space? Are they on the same level as the audience? That's the kind of answer you can, you can find to this specific issue. Like spaces are an answer to, is the story collective or individual? Yeah. And that completely changes the perception, doesn't it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. In the rehearsal room, we've spent a lot of time trying to navigate the cultural and historical distance between the world described in the play and the world we live in today. Uh, the question is, how do we go about bringing the distance, bridging the distance for a modern audience between these two different worlds? It's a very big question, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but at the same time, it's not. <laughs> because it's, my, my first answer will be, don't, don't make it too big because it's a problem with any text. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, it's what theater does, bridging, bridging a text with an audience. It's, it's the job of theater. And it's the same problem. I, I see that from a French perspective. It's, for example, very complicated for French actors, French directors to perform British contemporary theater. And it's not far, right? It's just across the channel and it's the same time, but it's already very complicated. So, and, and it's, a, you will always have this problem when you're performing something. So you can also think about it as, that's my job, that's theater, and not that's a tragedy, wow. <laughs> and, and then it becomes like much more approachable. But then the second answer is, do you want to bridge the text with your audience? That's also your choice. That's also a dramaturgical choice. And um, do you want to make it make the distance obvious and to work with the distance or maybe emphasize the foreign effects of the text? Or do you want to make it more familiar to the audience? That's completely your choice. I mean, I think there are so many different ways um, in which uh, a play can speak, speaks to its audience. Uh, and it's not necessarily, a, you know, an, an, an intimate uh, directness. Uh, what you have got to do is, if the play doesn't speak to the audience at all, then then it, there's no point in doing it. Uh, but uh, speaking to does not necessarily mean uh, familiarity. It doesn't necessarily mean, uh, perhaps particularly doesn't mean that uh, it's just something you should be comfortable with. It does seem to me, though, Estelle, that I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right that even a play written yesterday is already distant in a sense, let alone one that's written in a different, uh, for a different society. And then even within our own society, it's not as if we're homogeneous and far from it. Um, but uh, with ancient Greek plays, they perhaps are, they have a, sh they, 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 the simultaneousness, simultaneous distance and closeness, uh, the coexistence of distance and closeness is particularly um, acute, particularly marked somehow, particularly uh, powerful with ancient Greek plays. I mean, I'm not saying it's more powerful than Shakespeare or more powerful than I've seen. I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying that it, that it is both very distant and very close in a way that uh, many, many, um, later plays are not. 
So I, I think Estelle's absolutely right. You've got you you know you've, you've got these kind of two uh, pots to draw on, and you you have to decide how to uh, how to make the recipe. What about um, the relate? I mean, taking it back into the ancient world, what do you think the relationship between the world portrayed on stage and the world of the ancient audience? What do you think about the distance there? Uh, well, I mean, I would say you do, in, in principle, you don't have to allude to ancient Greece at all. Uh, it's up to, uh, that, that, that again is up to you. I mean, I think, I mean, I've, I've worked, uh, I've, I've been with a director who said the very first thing I tell my cast is forget all about ancient Greece. You know, they're doing a, putting on a Greek, forget all about that. We're, we're putting on a contemporary play for a contemporary audience. Now, I think that is problematic because if you do that, you lose a whole source of possible ideas and a whole source, of, you, you know, you, in a way you say, my world is so important, you know, the present is so important that no other world of any other time or place matters, which I think is an impoverishment. But in principle, you don't have to allude to ancient, Greek, to ancient Greece at all, it seems to me. That is very interesting because on the one hand, I, I do sort of, I do, I do agree, but also we have found moments where, you know, the, you know, the actor will say, I don't, I don't understand what, what this is about. And then, you know, if we bring out a piece of sort of historical reference and go, well, it might be like this in line might be like this because the, these might've been the original performance conditions or th this is this myth that it's referring to and that that's why you're saying this now maybe. And I think sometimes they have found that very helpful, but but I do completely agree that thinking, oh, well, we have to somehow attempt to recreate whatever, whatever may have gone on in ancient Greece is not, is also not the way, the way forward. Yeah, my, my answer to that um, is an answer as a dramaturg, as a dramaturg in any play I, I work for, um, I bring some historical information to the, to the team, right? We, we work on that with the company. Um, but I always say, this is not, we, we are not studying it, okay? The idea is not to have knowledge at the end. The idea is you know about it to help you do what you have to do, and then you forget about it. I always say to, to everyone in the room, please work with what you remember from this session and not with your notes as you're not in school. And the traces you have, will be better than any knowledge you have from this session. So it's necessary, it's a step, but it's not the aim. Except if you want to reconstruct the play, but then you are in a historical you know, process and it's not the same. If you're in a creative process, forget about the story at some point and dream about it, work on traces. Well, that's great. I mean, I think that's a very good account of what the dramaturg is about, and also from my experience, uh, uh, which is might be much more amateur than than, than yours. Um, the other thing I think is that thinking of the audience, you you, I, I do feel uh, it's very important that the play should be put on in such a way that the audience does not need pre-education, and does not need footnotes, and does not need a, a program. The play should the play should come across in its own right. Uh, however much you've absorbed uh, this historical material and so on, 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 on your way to arriving at it, you shouldn't require it of the audience. I think actually one of the, the not necessarily hardest, but one of the very interesting moments where we have experienced that link to the past is actually through the humour of the play and, and how, and the allusions to other plays and seeing maybe seeing Euripides uh, in his own script. Uh, I think I thought that was sort of explaining the jokes to, to some of the actors or trying to understand them was a, took me to the past in a way. <laughs> I think this actually leads us on to our last question, which is how, how can we understand Greek drama through modern ideas of what theater, of what theater is? or through, yeah, our modern ideas of theatre. Um, for example, often people's perspective of what theatre should be is one based on naturalism. 
Is there anything we can gain from using modern ideas to approach Greek drama? Um, my first answer, once again, as an artist, is that you have no choice. You, you, you have contemporary actors, contemporary spectators. You can only rely on contemporary methods of acting and, and making theater, except if you, once again, except if you want to reconstruct something historical. So of course you will gain from that. Um, I mean, and, and you're asking about naturalism or realism. And what I've, what I've noticed watching a lot of uh, performances of Greek tragedies is that this um, naturalistic ways of acting is actually very helpful to dig into the Greek hero's psyche. So it's, it has helped directors to develop you know, with methods based on Stanislavski's theory, for example, um, it's led directors to develop new readings of the play, new aesthetics, and um, yeah, and, and that's that's necessarily good. I mean, if if you develop something new, it's good, right? So that will be my my first uh, my first point. I think I only half agree with that because some of the best productions I've ever seen of, of Greek tragedy have been very non-naturalistic, but the, what, they've, what they've required is they've almost required the actors to unlearn their Stanislavskian training and to learn some uh, a, a new kind of, uh, uh, if you like, stylized performance. I'm thinking, for example, of Arya Manushkin's uh, production uh, of the Oresteia, of uh, Yukio Ninagawa's production of uh, Medea, um, and uh, Peter Hall's, uh, well, Tony Harrison's production of, of the Oresteia, uh, all of which required months and months and months of rehearsal uh, while the uh, actors uh, and choruses learned new, whole new techniques. So, I mean, that's my qualification if you're saying, look, here we are, we're, we're given actors who are used to acting naturalistically, who may be earning part of their living from television, um, <clears throat> who are trained in, in, in methods of finding their role, which ultimately uh, um, are the Stanislavskian model. Um, if you only have a limited time to rehearse and so on, then, that, then as, you, as you say, <laughs> still it's a necessity, but I don't think it is uh, in the larger picture, it's not, it's not a necessity. There are other ways of doing things. And actually one thing I'd like to put in a plug for here is a, um, a new book on Brecht, Brecht and Greek uh, tragedy by Martin Ravelman that's just coming out. It's an enormous book, but um, it's very, very interesting to, to, to see, to get this Brechtian angle um, on, on Greek uh, theatre. Yeah, so I, I completely agree with, with Oliver. Um, but so yeah, I can give counterexamples. If you think about <laughs> Dita's Electra or uh, Marie Warner's Medea, then you have the Stanislavskian acting of kind of Stanislavskian acting, which is really helpful to go deep into um, um, yeah, the, the psychological situations. But I agree with Oliver. I also, I also prefer performances that are trying to work against this kind of training. And for me, I think the, the most interesting uh, performance will be Katie Mitchell's Woman of Troy, because she's actually working with both Stanislavskian techniques and Brechtian techniques. She's, she's working with psychology, um, building, you know, with improv, improvisations, um, the past of the characters, and going deep into um, how collective behaviors work when you're in a crisis, or in, in, in a trauma, when you're facing a trauma. Uh, so it's very, very Stanislavskian at first. But in the aesthetics of the play, then you have some slow motion dancing, and the chorus and, and the characters are addressing the audience directly. So you're, you're suddenly in some kind of distant kind of acting, some Brechtian acting. So she's, she's mixing both techniques. And I think for her, it's actually a way to work with what her actors are the best uh, at doing 
ends with this kind of weird place she is dealing with weird texts and how you deal with this distance and so she's using a bit of Brecht, a bit of Pina Bausch to respond to that. Yeah. And, and I think a way to mix and to, um, to mix contemporary methods of acting is actually a way to respond to your previous question because she is actually navigating both domestication and foreignization at the same time because she's using modern uh, methods of acting and mixing them. I think what uh, Estelle says about Katie Mitchell is is very interesting, and uh, it it is the, the key to why her productions of Greek tragedy have been among the most interesting, and they're also the most international. You know, they're uh, they're 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 not um, British in the way that uh, you were saying some, some some other productions are. It's also interesting in relation to the earlier discussion that. Uh, I think in all the productions of Greek tragedy I've seen by her, going right back to her Trojan women um, and her Aristia before her, uh, but then she did Trojan women again and Iphigenia. Um, the actors of the individual parts are also members of the chorus. Um, and they emerge from the chorus, so to speak, and go back into the chorus so that they are acting in, those bo in both of those two different ways. And that connects with with what Estelle was saying, I think, about bringing together these very different approaches, um, which also um, produce both a, a familiarity, the, the domestication, and a distancing, which is the foreignization. And if you're interested in that, Emma Coles has written a very interesting article about Katie Mitchell's um, methods of acting in directing Greek tragedies. And she's really summarizing what I, what I just said and going deeper into how uh, contemporary methods of acting are useful for um, directors who wants to stage Greek tragedies. Just as an add-on question, do you think in this kind of discussion of foreignization and domestication, do you think in dramaturgical terms, there is a point of no return where a tragedy stops being, can ever stop being a Greek tragedy. Maybe through what you were saying about the sort of actors, uh, the, the main characters becoming the chorus, is there a point where we erase um, the, the ancient from our modern interpretations? I'd say, no, it's always an artistic choice. If you decide as artists that this is your way to perform a Greek tragedy, it's a contemporary interpretation of Greek tragedy and it's fine. And if you decide we're going away from Greek tragedy, we want, it, we want to call it another way, it's fine too, it's your choice. I think I, ju I just, I, uh, that, that's right. I think just that if you do, if you do it, totally erase uh, anything to do with the genesis, if you like, uh, uh, then, then you you lose a lot of opportunities. You, you lose a, a lot of opportunities for enrichment um, because it then becomes just a constant matter of how do I uh, how do I update? <laughs> it becomes it becomes just a struggle to update instead of being an interesting interaction. But it's absolutely right. It doesn't. You you can. I mean, it can be done. Yeah, I agree with Oliver. As a dramaturg, I always end up telling directors at some point in rehearsals when they want to change everything. Uh, even, even working on Shakespeare, suddenly it's the third week of rehearsals. They want to change everything. They want to cut text. And my answer is always, okay, stage another text then. I mean, if you don't want to stage a Greek tragedy, don't stage a Greek tragedy, yeah. choose another text, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that will be my answer to, to a director as a dramaturg. Yeah. Or rewrite, write a new play. I mean, in the, I think Robert Icke's uh, Aristide, for example, was in the, you know, which was powerful, uh, but it virtually in, in effect erased and um, was a new play. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Estelle. I, th I think it's my job to wrap up because <laughs> otherwise we could go on forever. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, this has been this has been very rich, uh, very inspiring. And I think, you know, our, our listeners will definitely agree. 
uh, not only you know people uh, doing great tragedy, staging great tragedy, but also working on great tragedy, researching great tragedy, and working in the theatre um, uh, as well. So um, I look forward to seeing the play now, <laughs> Europe's Electra. And uh, next week we will talk about props, set, and costumes with Dr. Rosie Wiles and uh, uh, Dr. Michael Loy. Uh, and until then, um, stay healthy and um, I'll see you then. Bye, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.